Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Apostolos, uh, who's in my, my department. Um, so, you know, I, probably most everyone here is familiar with the rise of uh, home sharing, uh, where people who have properties that are being not being used can rent them out for money. Um, you know, Airbnb, obviously the most well-known, but there's a number of companies in this space that are doing more or less the same thing. Um, and they, they've grown really rapidly. Uh, Airbnb estimates that they're going to do 100 million nights this year, recent valuation on the order of $30 billion, uh, quite a bit larger than, than many hotel chains. Um, and you know, they've mostly been viewed as a, a beneficial development, so putting underutilized assets into use, uh, potentially getting some income for, for guests, diversifying the options that people have in a city, so mostly been a positive story. Um, but they've actually attracted quite a bit of negative policy attention. Um, some of it is focused on the fact that in these markets, hosts have the right to screen guests, and so this can lead to racial discrimination, and actually does lead to racial discrimination. Um, there's been a concern that home sharing takes uh, supply uh, off the long-term rental market to the, to the detriment of tenants in that city, right? So things get kind of converted into uh, illegal Airbnb hotels. Um, and another critique, and this really was kind of played up in New York City, uh, when the, the, the city was thinking about regulating Airbnb was the fact that it, it allows uh, hosts to impose costs on their neighbors, essentially by having people come in, there for short term, they take and, and uh, you know, make it less pleasant to live in that, that building. Um, and so you know, the idea is pretty, pretty simple. So imagine that this is the you know, Airbnb uh, apartment and this woman comes with her electric guitar uh, and she imposes a lot of noise on her, her neighbors. And this guy, the, the guy in the suit on the beach is the you know, rapacious capitalist who's getting the money. Uh, this, this, is the, this is the problem, right? Um, so you, know, you can think of home sharing in kind of this ne negative externality sense, right? Where hosts impose a cost on their neighbors, um, host gets the money, neighbors get the noise, and you can make an analogy to kind of the, these classic cases of uninternalized externalities, so pollution, overfishing, speeding while driving. Um, and you know, the, the, the economics take on this is not that you know, we don't want zero pollution, no fishing, no driving, um, it's that, that the market delivers an inefficiently large quantity of this bad thing. Um, and so, you know, what are some public policy options? Well, um, you know, some cities have taken it as well. We'll just ban this entirely. We we won't allow it. Um, you know, if we if we think instead, well, maybe we can just fix this externality problem. You know, you can imagine having like a Cosian bargaining solution where, if as long as rights are well allocated, you know, we can sort things out. Um, you know, this doesn't seem to work very well in practice. Um, you know, my neighbors. They smoke on their balcony, it gets into my apartment. I haven't tried to like pay them not to do that, right, um, yet. Um, you know, you could maybe try to, try to price this externality. This would be very difficult in the sense that, you know, you don't know what the, the, the costs are likely to be. Um, so in this paper, what we're gonna do is, is take another approach that's, you know, a, a potential policy option, which is instead, let's imagine we allocate the decision right to host to different groups um, and then see uh, from a social welfare standpoint, how do we like these different um, allocations, uh, the result in equilibrium. So, um, so the question we're interested in is uh, a normative question, is that who should make the home sharing hosting decision? And what we're going to do is frame it uh, as that the decision could be made by any number of different groups, starting with individual tenants, and it's just completely up to them to make the decision. Um, we're gonna consider what happens when building owners set a blanket policy for their entire building, so they either allow it or don't allow it. We'll consider what a city government would do. And then finally, we'll consider what uh, a benevolent social planner would do. And I'll tell you what kind of the incentives of each of these groups are uh, as I set things up. So our, our approach is gonna be, we'll allocate the decision rights to these different groups, we'll determine the resulting market equilibrium, and then we'll characterize uh, the welfare consequences of that particular equilibrium. So some definitions. We're gonna be interested in the price for home sharing stay in a city. 
Um, and this price is gonna be endogenous and it's gonna depend on the number of other hosts. So if the number of other hosts is higher, uh, this price will go down. If they're lower, this price will go up. We're gonna imagine that tenant slash would-be hosts uh, have an idiosyncratic hosting cost, C sub i, that's just the cost to them of, of hosting. Uh, we're gonna, to model the externality, we're gonna say um, that the tenant host is gonna have n neighbors that they can potentially annoy in a building. Uh, and they're gonna, a guest staying in a house is gonna impose a cost C sub e on every single neighbor. And so an additional listing or an additional hosting um, is gonna be socially efficient so long as P, this private benefit, is equal to both the cost of actually providing that service, the C sub I, and then also the social cost that they impose on all of the other neighbors in the building. So that's how we're gonna model the, this externality process. And so in the four regimes, I'll tell you, these are the incentives we're gonna give each group. So the individual tenant is just gonna to decide to host if the private benefit that they get is greater than their cost of hosting. So that's how a tenant makes a decision. A building owner is gonna set a building-wide policy. They're only gonna care about the rents that they can get from long-term rentals. That's how they, they make money, so they're just gonna make a profit-maximizing choice. The city is going to centrally adjust supply, and they only care about the tenants in their, they're only, they only care about the residents in this city. So kind of the motivation for this, if you look at hotel taxes, so if anybody's staying at a hotel and you see how much the, the hotel tax is, you know, it's very often double what the sales tax is in the city. It's an easy way for the city to kind of soak non-city residents in a kind of politically expedient way. And then lastly, we'll consider what the social planner does if they were considering both the benefits that accrue to hosts, but also to guests coming from, from somewhere else. Um, so we're gonna have a, a process where someone's gonna set a policy, if, if it's a regime where a policy gets set, people will be able to move without cost to different buildings, they'll make a decision, and then, then prices are going to get updated. F to start, we're gonna assume that people can move costlessly, we'll actually, we'll relax this assumption later. Um, so in the individual tenant decides regime, um, the marginal tenant who hosts, the person who's just indifferent, they're just gonna, their, their decision is gonna depend on is the price equal to their individual hosting cost. And as you can probably imagine, this is the equilibrium that gives you too much hosting in equilibrium. So if you see this visually, the bottom supply curve here is just the individual's cost. The curve that's right on top of that is the, the social cost of that hosting decision at different levels of quantity. You have a single demand curve. The pink area is essentially the, the people that are hosting what we'd rather they didn't. Their private benefit is not enough to equal the social costs that they're generating. Um, another bad thing about this equilibrium is you get people who, uh, who are hosting sort of mixed across buildings. And so there's people who are made, um, you know, definitely made worse off by this. So the people who are not hosting, they don't get any of the benefit, but they get this increased cost. Now let's consider that we'll skip the building owner and consider the city decides. The city is going to basically just behave like a monopolist. And so if you take that same diagram, they essentially are just going to restrict the quantity trying to maximize that green area, which um, allows them to, uh, you know, essentially get the monopoly rent from, from doing so. And so here, you get, you get kind of inefficiently too little hosting. And if you think that a city has already kind of decided what supply it has with how it's regulated hotels, you know, the optimal response to home sharing might be to ban it completely if you already think you're at the optimal quantity. Um, now the building owner decides equilibrium. So the building owner only cares about profits from the long-term rentals. Um, and we're gonna make a, an assumption that kind of drives the equilibrium result, which is that the building owner is going to be, um, there's no policy arbitrage. So I said that the building owner only gets money from long-term rents, so they can't take, and if, if, if it was profitable to change their policy decision for their building, so if they could charge higher rents by offering Airbnb or not offering Airbnb, uh, they would. So in equilibrium, we're gonna assume that this no profit condition holds, What's gonna happen is the, the tenant, the marginal tenant who's just on the fence about hosting or not, is really making the decision, do they wanna be in a building that allows hosting or, or doesn't allow hosting? And what they're gonna consider, the rents are sort of drop out because the rents are gonna be the same because of this no policy arbitrage condition. They're only gonna consider what is the private benefit from being able to host in this building, but of all the costs 
that I have to bear if I choose to be in this building. Or if I go to a building that doesn't allow Airbnb, um, you know, none, none of this matters. And essentially, that, that's what drives the efficiency result. That's where you get the externalities being internalized and the social benefit is equal to the, to the cost. Yes? Somebody going away for a week? Or yes. Or just like rent Well, I think you should you think of this as, um, you know, I'm going to rent when I opportunistically can, right? And that's, that's the decision. That's sort of how much supply we're, we're talking about. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we're not, we're, we are not modeling sort of people entering in sort of a, like for for profit essentially, like coming in and, only, and doing sort of 100% of the time. We're kind of um, treating home sharing as sort of Airbnb presents it, which is something you do part of the time, but this is still sort of where you live but long you term. Hmm? You know in the data. Well, I don't actually, so even though this is called the experiments, I don't actually have any oh. experiments. <laughs> uh, but, I'll, but I'll give you some substitute data that, that is sort of a, similar. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is, this is where the building owner, you know, you get the social amount. It's the same with the, the, the city planner would, would choose. Um, and, you know, the other nice thing is that you kind of get the Airbnb friendly people kind of concentrated in, in certain buildings. Well, okay, so, you know, this, this, this result is nice, uh, but it really hinges on this no policy arbitrage. And, you know, ideally, you know, you could maybe look at Airbnb policies. The problem is that this is still so nascent that this doesn't really um, exist. We don't actually have data on what buildings allow it or, or don't. So what we're going to do as a proxy is uh, look at subletting decisions. So building owners do decide whether or not their building can allow subletting. And it's qualitatively similar to home sharing. It, it imposes, it has no direct cost on you as a building owner, but it potentially has a cost on your tenants. And so what we're going to do is take uh, about 20,000 apartment listings in New York City, where we can see the monthly rental rate, uh, square footage, location, you know, amenities, et cetera. Um, and we're, gonna, we're also going to observe whether each listing allows subletting. Right, so essentially that policy variable that we're interested in. And what we're going to see, um, if you just take and kind of do something naive and regress the log rental rate that's posted on an indicator for that the building allows subletting, you see allowing subletting 10% higher rents. Okay? Um, however, if you build a model where you try to take and predict the rental rate using things like location, square footage, all these other things, but critically don't use any of the policy variables, then use that prediction and add it to the model, um, you can see that the kind of building allows subletting gets a, you get a fairly precisely estimated zero. And we've done this with a bunch of different policy things like you allow dogs, you allow cats, which may you know, potentially have some cost. You get the same kind of result that in the data doesn't seem to be as a building owner, you can make a, a, a rent by sort of a uh, bad choice of words, make a profit by like picking one policy or the other. Um, so we have this kind of, uh, this no policy arbitrage. We have some evidence that it exists in the actual rental market that, that, that we see in practice. Um, I think in the interest in time, I'll probably sort of very quickly go through the simulation results. Um, kind of the most important one. So, you know, moving costs is kind of a, a huge aspect of this. Uh, and, you know, when we talked about this analytically, we sort of just assumed them away, but in fact, moving apartments is quite costly. So we did some simulations where we varied um, uh, the moving cost as a, as a fraction of the, the annual um, rent and then see uh, how do people sort. So this is an analytic, this is, this is actually an agent-based model. Um, you know, as you might imagine, as, um, co as, as moving costs increase, uh, tenant surplus goes down considerably. Um, and you, you actually get less sorting, that's the blue line. The surplus goes down it, it, at least partially because people end up getting stuck in the wrong kind of building. As, as the costs increase, there's people who, who are hosting that in some counterfactual world where costs were lower um, would choose not to. So you kind of get this deadweight loss of the, the wrong people being the ones who host. Um, supply stays roughly constant, but that's, it starts to dip a little bit. But that's kind of a function of the fact that as these costs get high, the equilibrium price starts um, increasing. And so uh, the, there's a supply response. Um, now, you might imagine in practice, too, that 
the types of people who uh, costs would tend to be correlated. Um, and you know, what you'd find is as, these, as correlation increases, so as, you, know, you have more places that have people with similar costs, you require much less sorting to get to, the, to this uh, proper equilibrium. So I think that's probably where I'll, I'll stop. Um, you know, I think, you know, there's still, this is, you know, not the last word on the public policy issues of, of home sharing, but I think at least this, this negative externalities aspect of it, um, there's kind of a pretty simple public policy approach um, that likely remedies the, um, the problem. <laughs>